Thanks everyone for coming. I'm really excited today to talk to you about my favorite animal in the ocean, the seahorse. Um, I'm a PhD student at UBC and I've been studying seahorses for about four years, a little bit before I came to UBC and a little bit while I've been here. And so I've studied seahorses in Brazil and in the Caribbean and also in Thailand. But what I'm really excited to tell you about today is um, kind of a little bit about why seahorses are so cool and then how you guys can actually help us to research seahorses because we have a new um, initiative that's just launching this week where you guys can help us to study seahorses around the world. Woo. Okay, so seahorses are really, really funky looking fish. First fun fact is that they are actually fish. Um, and so one thing that kind of draws me to seahorses first is they have this unusual looking snout, right, that I think really looks like a horse. And one cool thing about that snout is that it's actually their jaw which allows them to eat. And so the way that the seahorses eat though, kind of think about sticking a, a straw in your mouth and as fish swim by, sucking in on that straw to capture your prey to eat. And so that's, uh, that's kind of the, the way that seahorses eat. And that's the family that they belong to. They are related to a bunch of other different fishes who have this fused jaw type of a structure to eat. Um, so other really interesting things about seahorses that you may have noticed, they actually have this upright posture, and so they swim upright. And they have this really awesome tail that um, is very similar to a monkey's tail, and they can use it to hold on to different things in the environment. And very cool, they're the only fish species to hold your hand, Aww. which as a researcher I think is pretty amazing. <laughs> So seahorses live in both tropical and temperate waters. Most people think of seahorses as living just in tropical, beautiful coral reefs, but we actually have a seahorse species that lives off the coast of Canada, eastern Canada, not British Columbia. Um, but they're also found in cooler waters off of Argentina, off of New Zealand, and off of South Australia. And there are over 48 different types of species of seahorse. And so after the lecture, I've got some down here, and they come in all different shapes and sizes, and you can take a look at them. And the smallest one is about as small as a peanut, and the largest one is about larger than a ruler. So I kind of blew the punchline, how big do they get? This isn't actually a real seahorse, <laughs> but wouldn't it be cool if it was? <laughs> right, so these are, these are two of the biggest seahorse species. This one lives off the coast of Australia, and this other one lives in the deep, deep waters of the tropics, though. And the small, some of the smallest ones, as I mentioned, are what we call the pygmy seahorses. And literally, they're just the size of a peanut when they grow to be adults. And these are ones that are hard to, hard to see because they blend in with the environment. And so it can make them really challenging to look for them because they're so small and because seahorses have this ability to blend in with the environment. So their ability to camouflage or blend in with the environment is one way that helps protect them from predators, the things that eat seahorses, and it's another way that, that uh, they also can surprise their prey because the prey don't see them as they're swimming along. And so there are seahorses in each of these photos here. I'll point them out to you just so you can kind of adapt your eye to what it's like. Hopefully you'll be able to see my mouse, okay. So here's the snout down here, right? There's one. Okay, up here, this is another one. That's one of the little tiny pygmy ones, tail. Okay, over here. Down here, that's the seahorse. And then down here, whoo, we've got one right there. Yep. Okay. So another fun fact that I really like about seahorses are that some seahorse species mate for life. Uh, once they find a pair, um, a couple, they can stay together, definitely for within a breeding season, but some species actually stay together for life. And the way that they actually choose a mate is quite fascinating. So seahorses have this special um, dance that they perform with each other. And so they try and see if their dance moves are compatible before they choose a mate. 
And so the dance moves um, actually involve the seahorse changing color. So not only do you have to have the right dance moves, you also have to be able to have the right, the right colors as you're doing this dance when you attract your mate. And so many of you may have heard that it's the males that get pregnant when it comes to having seahorse babies. And this is true, this is an actual fact. And so males have this kangaroo-like pouch um, where the babies actually grow and then they're, they're released. And so you may be thinking to yourself, well, well why do they call them males if they're the ones that have the babies? And that's a great question. So, the female actually carries the eggs and puts the eggs inside the male's pouch. And so the male has the sperm, which is why he's called the male, um, and then fertilizes the egg once they're, the eggs once they're put into the pouch. And the seahorse fry grow for about anywhere from two weeks to one month uh, before the male opens the pouch and out swims away the babies. And depending on the size of seahorse, remember I said seahorses can be as small as a peanut or about as large as a ruler. The small species only have maybe between five or 10 babies at a time, but the bigger species can have up to like 2,000 um, seahorse fry at a time. And I think seahorses are really interesting because they live in lots of different types of habitats. So they not only live in coral reefs, uh, but they live in mangroves, which are places where the rivers meet the ocean, so they have a different salinity than the normal ocean. They live in coastal bays and also in, in rocky reefs, like some of the areas that are off the coast of Canada. These same areas are also under threat from a variety of different activities around the world. Um, which is not good if you're, sea if you're a seahorse because that means that your home is under threat. Um, another thing that you may not know about seahorses is that there is a lot of international trade for seahorses. Mostly they dry them um, and sell them for traditional uh, medicine purposes. If you actually go to Chinatown here in Vancouver, you can see the dried seahorses uh, in kind of any one of the traditional medicine stores there that they use to cure anything from asthma to arthritis to back pain to male fertility problems. Um, and so there are over seven million seahorses that are traded per year and the, the majority of them are dried. There, there is a little bit of live trade, mostly for the aquarium trade, um, but the majority of the trade is dry. Uh, another thing that also threatens seahorses is they're caught accidentally sometimes in fishing gear. Um, and so basically when nets go through the water, sometimes they're not uh, very selective in terms of what species they catch. And since, it, since seahorses are quite small and they're not very good swimmers, sometimes they can actually get caught up in the fishing nets. Um, and then that's how they enter the dry trade. So you may be wondering, Oh no, are all seahorses of the world threatened? What's their status? And so uh, globally, there's something called the Red List of Endangered Species, which tries to evaluate um, the risk of extinction of different species, both marine and terrestrial, around the world. Um, and so for seahorses, there are 12 that are considered under threat of some sort or are at risk mostly from um, habitat degradation or from this dry trade. But there are a lot of other seahorse species, more than half, um, where we just don't really know a whole lot of information about them, where they live, what their population sizes are like. So we really can't uh, kind of determine if they're at risk or not. Another interesting thing about seahorses is that they're actually regulated at an international trading level. So there's a convention, the same sort of convention that regulates and bans like the trade in ivory for elephants and elephant tusks. It also regulates seahorses. You can trade seahorses all over the world. All you need to do is kind of report it and get a, a permit to actually do so. And the main purpose of it being regulated is try to, to try to make sure that trade doesn't harm the wild seahorse populations. And so a lot of our efforts, I work with this group called Project Seahorse that's based here at UBC. 
um, to try and study seahorses around the world um, in an effort to make sure this trade is sustainable for different local populations. Um, and kind of it's to address this overwhelming idea that there's not a whole lot of information about seahorses because they live in a lot of different countries over the world. Over 80 different countries are involved with their trade. And there's some international requirements, uh, you know, to help countries ensure that their trade is sustainable. So this is a picture, a map, of where all the different seahorse species are found all over the world. As you can see, it's pretty much everywhere. Um, and so you may be asking yourselves, how in the world can we at Project Seahorse study all these different seahorse species all over the world and, and try and gather enough information to see, if, to see if they're under threat? Well, that's a giant question and takes a lot of effort. And we're actually launching a program this next week called I Seahorse, which is trying to engage the public people that go to the beach, people that go scuba diving, people that go snorkeling in places all over the world to tell us about your seahorse sightings, to help us try and answer some of these questions about where do seahorses live in all these different countries all over the world. And so that's what I'm going to focus the next little bit of this talk on, is trying to encourage you guys to become our seahorse citizen scientists and tell us uh, where, where you have seen seahorses in the past or where you may see them in the future. Um, and so the idea is to get people, people that, that go to the beach, that are out in the water, helping us to, to know where we can find seahorses and even where we can't, because that's also quite important. And so in conservation in general, this idea of having uh, people report their sightings of different types of species all over the world is quite common in terrestrial, um, terrestrial systems with different types of animals. And one place where it's been really successful has been with birds. And so I don't know if you guys are familiar with um, the, the Bird Life Citizen Science Program where it asks people if you see birds along migratory routes to kind of report the different birds that you see as a way to help identify where birds are going at different times of year. And actually what it's done is to help create maps all over the world to see what types of species live in different parts of the world. So that way you can focus, say, bird conservation efforts. And so what we're trying to do is do the exact same thing with seahorses. And so our new initiative is called iSeahorse. Um, it's an online website, but it's also an iPhone application, so you can download it on your iPhone. Um, and it allows you to basically record your sightings about seahorses, and it goes straight to us at Project Seahorse. And you guys can tell us where you've seen seahorses, what species you've seen, and if you have a photo, you can upload a photo also, and it'll, it will help us to be able to identify different hot spots or areas where you can find lots of seahorses for us to be able to go back and do uh, more research in those areas or actually to be able to look at protecting those sorts of sites for conservation. Oh, and you can also register on this I Seahorse initiative with Facebook and with Twitter and with Flickr. So we're trying to make it really easily accessible for lots of different people. Um, and so this is kind of what the IC Horse um, interface looks like. It allows you to upload a photo. You can share information about what species you're seeing in different areas with other, other people that are also involved with IC Horse. And at the end, it basically plots your sighting um, of the seahorse on a map so you can see where, where it fits in its range and actually where kind of other users are potentially seeing similar types of seahorse species. And we've done a couple of test runs with this in Southeast Asia, and it's been really exciting because we've had reportings of seahorse species that we didn't know even existed, say, in Thailand, for example. And it turns out that, that people are seeing them, and there are actually new, new species that are being observed in new locations, which is quite cool. Um, and so this IC Horse Initiative is run here out of the University of British Columbia, but also with our partners at the Shedd Aquarium in Chicago. 
And so basically what, what you'll do now that you guys are avid seahorse citizen scientists, when you see a seahorse, you're gonna record your observation. And this is called a sighting. Um, and basically what we're trying to do is to monitor these sightings over time to see if the pop seahorse populations are increasing, decreasing, or staying the same. And then if we can generate enough data in the same sort of area over a long time, you can see the, the trend of seahorses over time. And what we're hoping to be able to do, just let, as the birding people have done, is basically be able to link these population trends with different sorts of activities that are going on in the area. So if people are constructing a new port, or if they implement a protected area, maybe we'll be able to see changes in the population based on different sorts of activities. And so online, we have a seahorse toolkit, which basically trains you to be our brand new seahorse scientist. And it's on iseahorse.org. But since I thought you guys were so excited to be new seahorse citizen scientists, I thought I would take you through some seahorse identification. And then if you're super keen, you can come down here and practice your seahorse identification um, at the end of this talk. So, seahorse identification. Um, the most important thing is that color is actually not very useful in trying to identify what seahorse species you're looking at. Because remember, seahorses can change color to blend in with their environment. So a seahorse that looks red may actually look green if it's living in a different habitat. So what you wanna do instead is look at different parts of the seahorse body to be able to help identify between different species. So this is a seahorse. Um, and the, the one thing you wanna look at to tell the male from the female is the males have this big pouch right here and females do not. It's right kind of underneath the belly, right where the tail joins at the belly. And if it's a male, there'll be a pouch, and you'll fully be able to see it. And if not, um, then it's a female. Other sorts of things that you can look at to help you identify. So this is the snout of the seahorse. Some seahorses have long snouts, and some have really short snouts. Um, other ones have this thing at the top of the head called a coronet. And it's kind of like a crown that sits on the top of the seahorse head. And so sometimes the crowns are really pointy and spiky. Sometimes they're really tall and distinguished. And sometimes they're pretty flat and pretty inconspicuous, almost like you can't tell that there's a crown on top of the seahorse head. Other distinctive parts of the seahorse that you want to try and look at are the eye spines right here or the nose spine, right where the snout meets the face. Also, these cheek spines right here are quite useful in helping to determine um, which seahorse species you may be looking at. And kind of generally the way you want to start, you can almost think of if you start with your eyes closed, and if, if you were going to feel the seahorse, would it be spiky or would it be smooth? And so when you come down here, I can show you the difference between a spiky seahorse and a smooth seahorse, because you'll clearly be able to see just from looking at it kind of how spiky the spines are on it to be able to tell if it's smooth or spiky. Okay, so to be able to sex the seahorse, right, the males have this swollen brood pouch, which is a clear distinction that it's a male. Okay, so now I figure you guys are ready for a pop quiz, okay? Is this seahorse a male or a female? If you think it's a male, raise your hand. If you think it's a female, raise your hand. Yay! You guys are pros already. But just in case you are having a little bit of a question, I'm going to give you another quiz. Okay. This one. Who thinks it's a female? Who thinks it's a male? This one is a female. What about this one? Who thinks that it's a male? Female. Great job, everyone. It is a male. Good job. Okay. So now I'm just going to give you a quick seahorse sampler. Oh, we have a question in the back. Sorry, can yes. you back up to that in the male and the female? Sure. So um, does 
That's a great question. I'm going to repeat the question just in case people didn't hear it. So the question was, does the shape of the pouch actually change at different times of the pregnancy, similar to humans? And the answer is yes. So when the pouch is not very full or when the male seahorse is not pregnant, it's pretty flat up against the belly. And um, it's not very distinguishable. But once the seahorse is pregnant, kind of the, the fish fry do start to grow and the pouches actually can get quite big, like you saw in that other picture. So I would say this seahorse right here is very, let's call him recently pregnant because his pouch is not quite as swollen as the others that we saw previously. So, so then the, the, the male definitely Um, so you can actually see the pouch is generally a different color, like a little off color from the rest of the body. And you can definitely tell that there's kind of an, an extra layer kind of, of, of skin here on the males that the females do not have. Um, so it is quite, quite, quite distinctive and you can actually tell even if the male is not pregnant. Nice, nice. Hmm? Sure. Okay, so a quick seahorse sampler about four different seahorse species in different parts of the world. And so I'll start with the one that we have off the coast of Canada. I know, it was quite a surprise to me as well to find that they had um, a seahorse, this one, um, that lives off the coast of Nova Scotia, actually. We don't actually have one that lives in British Columbia, but this seahorse lives all the way up to Nova Scotia all the way throughout the Caribbean, down south, down into the southern parts of Brazil. So its range is quite expansive. And this seahorse is what we call a generalist seahorse species, which means that it can live in a lot of different types of habitat, which I think is why it has such a big giant range. Um, and so it lives in waters as shallow as one to two meters, but all the way down to the deep depths of 70, 73, 74 meters in the ocean and it's actually been caught in some of the fishing nets off the eastern coast of Canada, which is how we know that its populations um, go all the way up here. So the distinguishing factors of this seahorse is that it has a relatively short snout. Um, it has what we consider to be a fat body, and on its head and its neck over here, it generally has some sort of pretty pretty stripes or pretty lines, um, which is how you can distinguish this from the other seahorse species that lives in the Caribbean and in the Atlantic. So if you're in Canada, there's only one seahorse species that lives in Canada, so it's this one. Um, <laughs> but if you happen to be, let's say, in the Caribbean or in uh, Florida in the USA, there are actually two species that, that do live in, in that area, this one and the other one which has a really, really long snout. So you'll definitely be able to, to tell the difference. So there's a picture of it. And so you can see kind of those lines, um, which almost kind of look a little bit like glitter going up the side of the body and then down onto the nose. And so most of, most, um, of the ones that live in Canada look like that, which is great. And so here's a picture of that species in the wild, but from the opposite end of its range down in Brazil. Now I'm gonna take you all the way across to the other side of the planet, where we're gonna talk about the largest seahorse species called the big belly seahorse, um, which lives off the coast of Southern Australia and New Zealand. It lives in some of um, the colder waters in terms of seahorse distribution. Um, and it's called the big-bellied seahorse because it does actually have the biggest belly. And its size, kind of if, if it's fully stretched out, is just over the size of a ruler. It gets to be about 36 centimeters as a full-grown adult, which is quite big. And so um, the things that distinguish this seahorse from other ones um, 
Because it has such a big belly, when the males are pregnant, it looks like it just has a huge, gigantic belly. Um, and its dorsal fin, which is the one on the back, is relatively long. So that's a picture of the, the big-bellied seahorse. You can clearly see the big belly right there. Um, okay, so here's a picture of a juvenile big-bellied seahorse, but do we know if it's male or if it's female yet? Oh, bring back that quiz. Who thinks it's a male? Who thinks it's a female? It was a male. All right, good job, guys. So even as a, as a juvenile heading into sexual maturity, you can see the pouch right there. Okay, great, great job. So now we're going to move a little bit into Southeast Asia. Southeast Asia has the highest number of different seahorse species in the world. There are 14 different species that live in Southeast Asia. And this is where you find the pygmy seahorses, which are the smallest ones that are just about the size of a peanut. And you can also find one of the, the other largest species at the opposite end of the spectrum, the Kellogg seahorse, which um, is just about the size of the ruler, just about 30 centimeters as a full-grown adult. So there are quite a variety of different species that live in Southeast Asia. So I'm going to tell you about two of them. So the first one is a pygmy seahorse called the Barbagant seahorse. This one literally is the size of the peanut. Um, and so you can see this one has a ridiculously short snout. And it looks kind of ugly, if you ask me. Aww. <laughs> Aww. And it also has these interesting things that we call tubercles that are on its body. But they're basically little bumps that help it to blend in with the coral that it lives on. Because the coral also has similar types of bumps. So for example, here's a picture of the Barbagant seahorse. Um, and so the cool thing is that its little tubercles or those bumps actually tend to be the color of the coral species that it lives on. And it only lives on a, a type of coral called um, a gorgonian, uh, which tends to be this pinkish color. So these seahorses are very, very pretty. They're very, very tiny. And so sometimes scuba divers have to take a magnifying glass when they go scuba diving in order to find them. The next one I'm going to tell you about is called the tiger tail seahorse. And you can probably tell it's called the tiger tail because of its pretty tiger stripes on its tail. But it also has two cheek spines and a pretty small coronet or a pretty small crown on the top of its head. So here's a picture of the tiger tail seahorse. So you can see it's got the, the stripes on its tail in the back. And it has two cheek spines, one, two, right here. All right, so now we're going to give you guys a little quiz again, OK? Who thinks that this is a pygmy seahorse? Who thinks that this is the big-bellied seahorse? All right, excellent job, guys. Training is paying off. You're starting to be professionals. I like it. Okay, now we're switching back to the ones that's found off the eastern coast of Canada. For the last time, we'll do male versus female training. Okay. Who thinks this one is a male? Female. Ooh, this one's a feet. Uh, no, it's a male. Sorry. <laughs> good job, good job. Almost hit myself. All right, what about this one? Who thinks it's a female? Who thinks it's a male? It's a female. Yeah. Awesome. So good job, everyone. OK, now for the final seahorse identification quiz of the day. Looking at this species here, remember it's got two cheek spines and a striped tail. Who thinks that this is a pygmy seahorse? Who thinks that it's a tiger tail seahorse? Yay! All right, guys, well done. Um, so you may be thinking, OK, I'm doing really good with telling male and female seahorses apart. You're starting to recognize what signs to look for to tell the different species apart. But what happens when you come across a seahorse species and you're not really sure what it is? It's a great question, and it happens a lot. 
So what you should do is take a photo of it, try and take a photo of the face, and also a photo of the whole body, and you can send us that photo of the seahorse, and we can help you to identify it. Um, and if you also are having trouble identifying the seahorse, it's also important to maybe write down some sort of like relative size of the seahorse, like maybe it's about the size of my thumb, or the size of a banana, or the size of a peanut. Um, and also kind of if there are any sort of distinguishing fe features that you can see on the seahorse. Okay, so if you're interested to learn more about how to become a seahorse citizen scientist and how to go out and tell us um, about where you find seahorses around the world, we'd love to hear from you. Uh, we also have more information on our website. Um, www.iseahorse.org. As I said, there's an iPhone application that you can download to tell us about your seahorse sightings. And don't worry, we're not looking for people that are just scuba divers or snorkelers. Seahorses can actually be found in tide pools also. So if you happen to just be looking in the tide pools around the rocky reefs, you may find a seahorse and we would love to hear about it. Um, so please, Register thy seahorse, tell us about your seahorse sightings. So thanks for coming and 